Hello, my name is Salman Yusuf. I'm presenting our research, which is the volume estimation for hazard reduction burn using a voxel-based approach. The co-authors for this paper are Dr. Jack Barton, Dr. Ben Gorte, and Professor Sissi Zlatanova. Hello, my name is Salman Yusuf. I'm presenting our research, which is the volume estimation for hazard reduction burn using a voxel-based approach. The co-authors for this paper are Dr. Jack Barton, Dr. Ben Gorte, and Professor Sissi Zlatanova. The rising global warming has induced the world's climate to change abruptly when natural disasters occur with high severity and high frequency. This costs lives, distress infrastructure, disturbs established environmental cycles and affects the health, well-being and economic resilience. For example, the increasing temperature dehydrates the vegetation and brings the fuel closer to its combustion point. This causes severe and frequent burns. There are four factors that contribute to bushfire, which are the temperature, vegetation type, topography and wind. The 2019-2020 bushfire has been dubbed as one of the worst bushfire seasons in Australia about 2 million hectares of land in New South Wales and Queensland alone were wasted. More than a billion animals have also perished during this time. This is why it is paramount that communities and fire authorities in bushfire-prone regions of Australia understand fire-related characteristics of nearby bush in order to comprehend the potential hazard for these fuels and their related fire behavior for effective decision making. This is an illustration of a forest profile. It consists of five vegetation components. The crown fuel, less than four meter height. It consists of leaves and twigs. Bark fuel covers the tree trunk, upper branches, and twigs. Usually right above the ground is considered surface fuel, which usually consists of material with a mixture of dead and live fuel. At 0.3 meters to 0.6 meters, it is considered near surface fuel, and at 0.6 meters to 2 meters, it is considered elevated fuel. Near surface fuel and elevated fuel controls the spread of fire from the ground to the crown layer. Once it reaches the crown layer, an out of control higher severity bushfire is inevitable. One of the aspects to be considered for this guide are the fuel load to assess the hazard score. Fuel load is the accumulation of vegetation in a forest profile that are measured in tons per hectare. Fuel load is an important factor and it is crucial to get the right form of data because underestimating the fuel load leads to low estimates of bushfire. That risks eliminating areas for hazard reduction burn, leaving properties underprepared. Overestimating leads burning when aware it's unrequired. This has environmental cost and logistical implication. The traditional method of measuring fuel load is by cutting the vegetation, over drying it, and then weighing it. This method is time consuming, labor intensive, and costly. This is why it becomes increasingly important to investigate automatic approaches to acquire fuel load data. LIDAR has been extensively used in the study of forestry characteristics. Most research done with LIDAR focuses on quantifying the crown fuel and the vertical structure of trees in a forest profile. There are limited studies done in the near surface fuel, elevated surface fuel, and surface fuel. For this research, we're using a voxel-based approach to study the point cloud of the forestry profile. Voxel is the volumetric pixel, and it is suited for this research as they are simple and unified, as can be seen in the illustration. The terrain is put through a voxel space. Inside the voxel space, there are voxels that could either be empty or filled. For this research, we're interested in the field voxels. Processing in voxel space brings three major advantages to the point cloud space. First, the size of the data to be processed can be reduced significantly. Second, the voxel space allows to establish connectivity horizontally and vertically, which facilitates analysis. Third, the effect of different point density can be reduced, which will be favorable for fuel estimation. The work 
flow on the right shows our approach for this research. Using airborne LiDAR, we scan the area of interest, determine the spatial resolution. Once the resolution is determined, the forest profile needs to be classified, which are based on the canopy, tree trunk, elevated surface view, nearer, and near surface view. After the elevated surface view and the near surface view was determined, we calculated the point density to understand where the highest vegetation points are located. The outcome of this research is a fuel load map at near surface and elevated view. The methodology was applied to a data set representative of a typical Australian bushland obtained from Fire and Rescue New South Wales in Vermont Place Park, Warner Spring, Newcastle. The airborne LiDAR point cloud is collected by a low altitude drone platform and has an absolute accuracy of 50 millimeter range at 50 meter range of RMSE with three returns. An RMS ranging error of 30 millimeter and a scan rate of 420k points per square meter. The point cloud was transformed into a local coordinate system by truncating the geographical coordinate with the minimum values of X, Y, and Z. Picture 3 shows the point densities of point cloud across the study area. In this visualization, each pixel is 1 meter square and has density shown representative of the number of lighter points at each vertical column. Picture 4 shows the distribution of point density classes. The most frequent class is at 300 to 400 points per meter square. This suggests that the point density within each cell is sufficient for modeling and analysis. The voxel analysis are performed with an in-house J-based software. Determining the special resolution of the voxel space is very important as it determines the subdivision of points in the voxel space. This is a 2D representation of a voxel space. A illustrates that all cells are non-empty. B has a higher resolution having 16 cells that are non-empty and one that is empty. C illustrates that there are 21 empty cells if the resolution is four times finer. Fuel load assessment uses a diameter of 0.50 meters to knee height. A voxel's resolution of 0.40 meter was determined to be optimal for this research in that each structural fuel layers could be classified belonging to a particular stratum of voxels and subdivided accordingly. After the resolution has been determined, we proceed to classify the terrain in the forest profile in order to get the true height from the ground to the canopy. In picture one, the terrain is normalized by shifting the upper profile to the lower profile. This was achieved using triangular irregular network by subdividing the point cloud through a square grid of tiles 4 meters by 4 meters and taking the lowest point from it. The voxel space is then created above the normalized tin. The canopy region are classified by assuming the crowns of the trees from the high density region of field voxels in the voxelized point cloud. The region are determined based on applying 3D mathematical morphological operation like dilation and erosion. The structural element used for dilation and erosion considers the nearest neighboring voxels. Canopy was determined in three steps as can be seen in picture one, two, and three. Two iterations of dilations are applied to the first picture to fill up the holes in the canopy. This also makes the components in the voxel space to increase. Four iterations of erosion and two iterations of dilation are applied in picture two. This makes a small object in the voxel space that got extended like the tree trunk and understory fuel layer to disappear. Connected with component labeling is applied to assign unique label to the adjacent object voxels. After this, the size of each object can be easily established from a histogram and only large objects remain as canopy. After the canopy has been classified, we go on to classify the tree trunk. The voxel space approach is efficient in classifying the tree trunks in a voxel space. The tree trunks cut vertically through the voxel space through the understory fuel layer and end up to support the canopy. For this study, the trunks would have resulted in overestimation of data when calculating the voxel value of the near surface and elevated fuel. As an in-house J-routine identifies vertically contiguous voxel columns, assuming they approximate tree trunks. If there is a large enough connected group of field voxels, we expect this to be a typical of our trunk. 
The routine looks for groups of 10 vertical boxes with at least 9 filled. Picture 4 shows the forest profile in a section of a voxel space having the width of 10 voxels. The mid graphic shows the isolated tree trunks and the lower shows just the remaining voxels. They can be considered vegetation that have to be assessed for fuel volume. The, coloring, the color coding shows red to blue, and red represents the more non-empty voxels in the section, and blue as the less non-empty voxels. Having removed everything but the structural layers of the elevated surface and near surface, the two layers can be further analyzed to estimate the amount of undergrowth of vegetation at each level. It is important to state the lowest box in each column representing the ground plane, having no lighter points below the ground level. This is voxel 0. At resolution of 0.40 meters, voxel 1 and voxel 2 represent near surface view, and elevated surface view is upward from voxel 3. In this slide, we show the elevated field and the near surface field visualized through cloud compare. After the uh, near surface and elevated surface fuel have been identified and classified, we go on to calculate the point densities in those uh, of the points in those layers. As can be seen on the picture on the left, which is the elevated surface fuel, and the picture on the right is the near surface fuel, the accumulation of the vegetation points can be seen. These are seen at 0.40 meter resolution. And so uh, the ones that are empty are boxes that do not contain any points and the ones that are filled, which can, are red over here, are the filled voxels. After the point density at elevated surface fuel and near surface fuel have been achieved, we go on to take circular radius of 10 meters across the plot and calculate the point density within those circular radius based on the coverage. The non-empty voxels containing are plotted in red and the white areas represent empty boxes with no lighter points. Density and distribution of fuel can be assessed even visually. The circular areas shown in the figures can readily be used by practitioners using the overall fuel hazard assessment guide. For example, blue areas indicate plant coverage less than 20%. Based on the amount of near surface and elevated fuel, these areas do not require hazard reduction burning. The other areas represent plant coverage greater than 20%. These areas have to be checked and qualified for hazard reduction burning. At this point, a visiting fire practitioner can arrive at the site pre-prepared to ground truth the data and inspect the areas indicate the highest risk and possibly direct any burns away from the blue zones. This is the end of my presentation, and I would like to say that UMB drones and LiDAR point plot have become practically ubiquitous and represent a big data resource. Use of voxels as demonstrated in this paper has enabled a substantial value to increase the interoperability, reusability, and a practical application. The workflow developed is a low-cost, processor-efficient, and fit for the purposes of serving as a decision support tool to support the fire practitioners. The next step will focus to ground truth and calibrate the voxel analysis method, specifically improving the terrain estimates and near surface fuel. Thank you for your time and co uh, cooperation, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. Uh, thank you for your uh, excellent presentation. So is there any question or comments for his presentation? So uh, I did not say, uh, see any question from the, the floor. So I have one question. So uh, are you going to uh, use uh, to develop your software that can support the integration of uh, your workflow model uh, with other data resources, for example, uh, climate information or population or etc. different kinds of uh, data uh, information that can be integrated with Voxel. Yeah, hi. Uh, that's a good question. Um, for now, as it is, it's 
for now, as it is, is just a map that shows where the accumulation of the vegetation is uh, located, basically showing where the highest accumulation is. But what you have suggested, which is pretty good, and that can be considered for future uh, researchers, like we can add on to the data, and that will actually, what you just suggested, actually will increase the precision of the data and uh, we can get more information. So, yeah, but as of where it is right now, it's uh, just showing at what location has the highest accumulation of vegetation. And for but the future researches we're progressing on is we're gonna ground truth it and we can add on to those features. Yeah, that's a very good idea to be honest. Okay, thank you very much. And is there any more question about his presentation? And I, I think it's uh, uh, your uh, presentation is very clear. And uh, so uh, thank you very much again. And I would like to maybe we, we move to the next presentation. So is the second presenter here? I am Sunny. Uh, yes, please. Um, hey, um, yes, I'm present here, so we could probably go on and start start the video and then we can move on to the question answer round after that. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, please, please. Research on the topic experimental study to compare factors influencing exit choice behavior in emergency evacuation situations using virtual reality techniques. Before we start, I want you all to quickly think about places you've visited in past week. For given the extraordinary circumstances we're living in, it is entirely possible that you might not have visited a lot of places in past months, let alone the last week itself. But just to humor me, if you think about your average week under sort of regular circumstances, you'd realize that we visit a lot of places and buildings like schools, workplaces, gyms, um, grocery stores, recreational places, etc. According to 2012-2013 Sydney HTS report, which is Household Travel Survey Report, um, more than 40% of our trips uh, destination are places other than school, home or work, or what you'd consider as non-frequent travel places. Now, emergency evacuation plan plays a crucial role in safe exit strategy of any building but in such places with high likelihood of gathering of large crowds without a proper access to evacuation plan, it becomes highly crucial to understand the impact of behavioral factors on the exit choice of the evacuees. Let's look at a couple of historical examples um, and see a few examples. On 26th February 1993, a urea nitrate hydrogen bomb was detonated in the basement of North Tower of World Trade Center. The structure sustained the damage and did not collapse into the South Tower as per the malicious plans, but it ended up being um, one of the biggest or the largest scale evacuation exercise in the history, with over 50,000 people evacuated from the building. During the exercise, the logical thing for evacuees to do would have been to follow the fire evacuation plan down to the safe assembly area. But going through the accounts of the event, it was noted that more than 90% of North Tower evacuees and 70% of South Tower evacuees reported walking through smoke. Now, when asked for reasons, uh, the reasons stated among others were uh, helping and warning others, trying to fight the fire, and I mean, to the extent of just plain simple curiosity. In another event, a station nightclub fire that broke out during a rock band performance on 20 February 2003 in Rhode Island claimed 100 innocent lives and injured 230 people. Incident records reveal that despite the venue being equipped with four exits in total, more than two thirds of the fatalities occurred near the main exit, as you can see on the top left picture on the screen, where most evacuees tried to rush to when the fire broke out. This clearly raises a question. 
what went wrong? Could more lives be saved in case we had a better understanding of how evacuees were going to react to the situation? The above two examples clearly demonstrate that there were factors that influenced evacuation behavior of people other than just the physical capacity of the building, egress time, walking speed, etc. Clearly, human behavior or behavioral factors played an equally important role in defining the outcome of those incidences. These behavioral factors, however crucial and important, have been hard to incorporate into planning softwares. Above, you can see a few examples of most widely used evacuation simulation softwares. While many of these, like Way Out, Pathfinder, don't provide functionality to model behavioral factors, few others are capable of rule-based or conditional modeling of these factors. Um, even when the functionality is there, often it is a cumbersome and difficult task to calibrate these factors due to lack of reliable quality data. This was taken up as one of the main challenges we would try and tackle through our research. Humans have primarily been modeled as homogenous entities without individual emotions or motivations. As described earlier, data collection from real events is very difficult, while most of the stated preference experiments lack the sense of danger in participants. Large-scale field experiments have similar disadvantages along with the risks associated with large scale crowds. Through this study, we aimed to devise an experiment to analyze effects of human factors on exit choice using virtual reality techniques. Here's a brief overview of the methodology adopted for the study. Through literature review, we finalized the factors that we were going to test in the study. The factors were clubbed into few groups and scenarios were designed. Once the scenario design was complete, suitable sites were located on Monash Clayton campus to capture 360 degree immersive footage. Equipment used to capture and display the scenario footage can be seen at the top right corner of the slide. Um, edited and finalized version of the footage was played to the recruits of the study and their responses were collected um, for model estimation. Here are a couple of um, sample videos trimmed from the final compiled video. As you can see in the example, participants had full freedom to make 360 degree movements to scan the environment around them. Uh, depending on the scenario, the footage was captured from a moving or a still frame reference. Each scenario and case had significant blank gap to record responses of the participants. Let's quickly go over the design of all three scenarios. Scenario one tested three factors, exit familiarity, herding behavior, and exit distance. Participants would be shown an initial video in which they would enter the virtual room from one of the two entrances as depicted by the blue dotted arrow. The participants would then stand at the position indicated by the blue circle. Based on the case, other participants may leave the room from one of the exits as depicted by the gray circles before um, the participant in question was asked to make a choice. Scenario two tested effects of exit signs and crowding. Participants depicted by blue circle would walk through the corridor and stop at the T-junction where they would see an exit sign with or without directional marking. Other participants uh, depicted by gray circle, moved in the direction uh, depicted by gray dotted arrows. Scenario three tested the effects of ex exit obstacles and physical stress or physical activity involved. Scenario three had two great separated exits. Participants would start at one of the two levels and make a choice. Some cases also had small obstacles blocking the exit that participants would have to go around to make an exit. Here's a summary of the final results of the experiment. Discrete choice models estimated for all three scenarios using open source Python based software Biogene um, are shown in the three tables on the left. Beta of each factor in each scenario 
uh, were final variable coefficients estimated, uh, which is effectively the weight of the factor in the scenario. So for example, beta f would be the weight of familiarity for that scenario. Negative sign of a coefficient would represent inverse relationship between the factor and choice of an exit. For example, beta d, which is the coefficient of distance from an exit, was modeled to be negative 0 0.496. This means that increase in distance of participant from an exit reduces the probability of that ex exit choice. ASC are alternate specific constants. So these are constants for alternate exit choices, so exit choice one and two. As an input to the model, ASC for first exit was always fixed to be zero. Interestingly, scenario one and two show no inherent preference towards any exit, while in scenario three, which is the scenario with grid separation, ASC2, which was for the first floor exit, came out to be negative and statistically significant. In the fact that participants preferred to climb down the stairs over climbing up the stairs. Arc elasticity of a factor is change in probability of exit choice of a particular exit when the factor is changed by a unit value. This helps in ascertaining the relative importance of factors against each other. So as you can see, um, familiarity ex um, and exit sign and um, activity came out to be the most influential factors in scenario one, two, and three, uh, respectively. It's one thing to come up with a model and generate results in an isolated environment, and a different thing to line those results up against some reference, for example, historical studies. This could further validate the results of the experiment and provide additional confidence in the methodology. So an experiment conducted in a warehouse setting by Ben Thorne and Franzik reveals that exit familiarity was valued at least twice as much as distance from the exit by participants, similar to the findings of our study. Um, Bode and Kotling suggested in their study that exit signage had a positive impact on exit choice, again, as confirmed um, by our study. Um, the results are expected to vary as layout of the virtual env environment changes but that is one of the strengths of this technique because um, numerous virtual settings can be tested for influence of same, um, same factor and relativities between the factors can be calculated with greater precision to suit the needs of that scenario. In conclusion, I would like to say that within the constraints of the study, time, resource, and budgetary constraints, it became abundantly clear that the use of VR technology or virtual reality technology has numerous applications in understanding the influence of human factors in exit choice behavior. The model produced by the data collected from the study agreed with historic um, accounts of similar studies and experiments. Methodology provided a fast, safe, and reliable means to test multiple factors um, in building presently constructed or maybe even in design phase as well. Thank you all for patiently listening to the presentation. Um, I wish you all a great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. So again, is there any questions about this presentation? Yes, uh, actually we got a, uh, a question from Abdul. Uh, yes, please. Uh, did, can you can you see the questions? I mean, in the Q and A. No. no. Uh, no? Uh, I, okay. I, I cannot. Read. See. Yeah. Okay, I will read the question to you. Uh, the question is: Real life evacuation exercises are often said to be biased, to be biased and not taken seriously enough by participants, leading to less reliable data collected. Do you believe we are based approach can overcome this? That's uh, a question. That is uh, that is a great question, and that was one of the factors um, that we were trying or questions we were trying to answer rather. Um, the advantage of um, and uh, this is a point I've alluded to in the presentation as well. The advantage of virtual reality technique is uh, within the virtual environment you can you can put um, cues for the participant 
to to make it more realistic of or or to increase the realism of the scenario as well for example um what we used were um were uh, the um um the emergency evacuation siren sounds so the the standard booping sound and the standard beeping sound um but if you want to go ahead uh, um or go a step further we can also include sort of virtual um um fire environments or you know um um cgi techniques to add that sense of realism when when someone's going through that virtual environment to make sure that they that the participants can actually feel the fear and um uh, make sure that the decision is not biased in any way or form and is as close to the real decision that someone would make um as possible okay uh there's another question uh, uh do you plan to see if there are difference depending upon the disaster type uh, for example firewalls or active shooter uh, another question uh, again um absolutely great question so the the study was basically um um designed to be the foundation to set sort of the basic methodology and it can be applied to any form of disaster depending on how you want the participants to realize the disaster in the virtual environment so um i can totally see as as you can say as you said that I, um the fire is one of the things that we can clearly realize if it's uh, presented in the virtual environment in terms of um let's say earthquake being an example we can use other ways and means to induce the um the effect of earthquake in someone who is being immersed in a virtual environment for example using um hydraulic techniques um to shake or move the 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 place or the chair or the platform where the participant is to make sure that realism and that connection with the virtual environment doesn't go away so yeah absolutely something that could be built upon um um and uh, further investigated okay thank you so is there any more question uh, uh yes. i have sorry yeah please it's sorry yeah uh, i have a question my question is you see uh in your presentation you just uh, uh, tested the three scenarios with uh, uh several like uh, factors like for scenario 1 you have 3 2 you have 2 3 you have uh, you have 2 uh, I mean why not combine the, combining them because in a real case you never can isolate it, this kind of uh, factors they are universal what do you think and what i going to do yeah Thank absolutely you. um uh, as i said because of uh, the the constraints um to the study itself and the way the study was designed we had we had to go with three separate um um simplistic scenarios because we were trying to validate whether the comparison can could be done at the first place or not but it's absolutely valid to design complex scenarios as well because once you start to design more and more complex scenarios there's um <coughs> correlations between these uh, factors that start to to play a role as well um and at the moment we just wanted to validate how the the virtual environment could actually play a role in in um in testing the behavioral factors to begin with but yeah as you said um adding more complex scenarios to to reflect the real life situations um is definitely that could be added into the um into the future of uh, the further research all right thank you okay thank you so is there any more question So uh, I think it's a very important uh, research and it's very meaningful and important for disaster management and thank you again for your presentation thank you thank you so much so we we, we now move to the next uh, speech speaker uh, oh, it's um, yeah please next um, mr hong is uh, using 3D web just to support the disaster simulation management and analysis is samples of tsunami and flood the author of this paper is professor hong and i we come from department of geomatics in national chengdu university in taiwan 
in my presentation, it has six sessions. It's, uh, that is introduction, methodology, implementation, test analysis, and we have the conclusion and final. In first section, we will introduce some background of this paper. In this page, we will use two examples to introduce the tsunami and flow disaster. The first example is the heavy rainfall in Japan in 2020 summer. The second example is the Pohoku earthquake and tsunami. Because tsunami didn't strike Ishinomaki in the last 100 years, a bridge with a height of 6 meters above mean sea level was chosen as a shelter of steel deaths. And finally, this decision eventually caused 74 deaths of steel deaths. From these two examples, we can find that the high information plays an important role in tsunami and flood disaster. So an optimal evacuation model must consider the high information to locate safe place for evacuation. In this page, we will talk about the 3D GIS. Many 3D GIS applications nowadays are restricted to visualization purpose only because of lack of the formalized and comprehensive mechanism for the management and analysis of future best 3D geographic data. So the integration of 3D geospatial data and cross-domain information provides a comprehensive basis of future-based data framework. And as the cost of creating 3D data is often expensive, the development of 3D SDI is necessary to facilitate the successful sharing and use of course domain 3D GIS data. And the, the major mirror of decision support system based on GIS is its cap capability to spatial analyze the given situation in and evaluate different alternatives. The purpose system is designed as a decision support system that allows users to import real or simulated disaster scenarios and automatically respond with the address damage assessment information. Next session, we will talk about the methodology. The first we will talk about is the hierarchy of 3D building modeling. In order to provide a feasible operation module to meet the various demands of simulated scenarios. We designed a multi-level hierarchical framework of 3D building units, such that the management analysis and visualization can be subject to the chosen level, like building, story, and household. And in this purpose, to ensure the correct linking between different levels of 3D building units, every building unit is assigned a unique identifier. In this page, we will talk about identifier and linkings to domain data. Like the left side picture in this page, various domains of data are designed and linked by common identifier. The 3D building framework survives as the core of 3D data with necessary geometry and essential attribute information. The, identi the identifier information is used to link into other available sources of data or domain data. And if the linking relationship can be created by common identifiers or the mapping of domain specific identifier, the scope of, an of analysis can be flexibly expanded without any limitation. And we have four components in smart decision support. The first component is to allow the decision makers to design customized scenarios for disaster analysis. And the second component is about the visualization of 3D data. And the third component is the variety of disaster loss analysis and visualization. And the final component is to provide decision makers a clear and objective reference for evaluating the trace from tsunami and flood disasters. In section three, we will talk about the implementation. The test site in this purpose is the Wujie Township in Yilan County. It's one of area in Taiwan that receives the high impact in the simulated tsunami potential analysis 
by the National Science and Technology Center for Disaster Reduction in Taiwan. The health of the area in Wujie Township has the tsunami flooding potential and the flood depth of one quarter of the area will reach one meter. In this page, we will talk about the data preprocessing. In this purpose, four types of geospatial data and two types of non-geospatial data are used. And as told as the in section two, identifiers are used to link hierarchy 3D building, disaster potential, in infrastructure and population data in our purpose. And here, infrastructure data is used for showing the building is used for shelters, school, nursing home, or not. Section 4, we will talk about the text analysis. First, we will talk about the system operational mechanism. At first, the decision makers can select cross domain data they wish to link for data preprocessing. Then decision makers can simulate disaster scenarios by specific disaster parameters like floating depths. And then based on the specific scenarios, the systems can automatically generate the disaster assessment outcomes. Then the systems will calculate and analyze the disaster loss index such as the trap population and affect buildings, stories, and households. An outcome can represent on the 3D building frameworks for the decision makers to make decisions. And finally, the purpose systems can be streamed on web 3D JS platform. There are total five cases in our purpose. The case one is the analysis and real representation of 3D overflowing. Like the right side picture in this page, the 3D representation provides a more realistic and alternative representation for assessing the impacts of four than the 2D. And after analysis, buildings, stories, or households which is impacted by the tsunami or force are represented with red color to indicate their emergency states, like the left side picture in this page. The case two is the feasible disaster index. We design the user customized index of disaster loss of population and damage of properties in this system. And like the picture in this page, total 18 index and 5 charts are designed and grouped into 3 categories. And the high risk query index can be used to highlight those building stories or households whose number of high variability population exceeds the threshold values to make spatial evacuation decisions. And the case three is about the multi-dimensional visualization with different applications and level of hierarchy. There are two examples to show the flexible visualizations of the purpose systems according to the chosen applications and level of building units. The example, the example one is about simulating the overflowing situation and predict the loss at different times during the tsunami strikes. Unlike other disasters, time factor plays an important role in tsunami di disasters. In example 2 is about the visualization according to the quantitative measure of chosen topics. Like the raw picture in this page, two buildings have different maximum capacity for evacuation. The dark color represents the higher capacity of the building, 
and a lighter color for lower capacity. The case four is the decision making of available evacuation place. This system can present the evacuation capacity in both the level of building and story. So decision makers can select the appropriate levels for making the evacuation decisions. For example, the building level can be used for regional evacuation and story level can be used for more precise arrangement of vertical evacuation. The final case is the evacuation simulation. There are two different concepts in the purpose framework of evacuation. One is the people concept and using network analysis to determine the shelter and evacuation routines with minimal working times according to the current location of people. And the other concept is based on shelter using the concept of the vice area to analyze. In the final section, we will talk about the conclusion in this paper. Many 3D dress applications nowadays are still restricted to visualization purpose. By proposing a web-based 3D dress system, we demonstrate how the disaster management can be improved by additionally considering the 3D characteristic for the for of tsunami and flood disasters. So we have the three major contributions in this paper. First is the hierarchy 3D building framework. This framework can provide a consistent geospatial reference for modeling various levels of building units and enable simulation, analysis, and visualization of disaster impacts according the levels of building units chosen. The second is identify a system across domain data. We decide the common identifier system for domain data linkage and exchange to facilitate the development of 3D SDI. And the final component is the integration of web technology and 3D GIS. Decision makers can design, analyze scenarios and alternatively impacts the analysis outcomes for assessing the damage and making evacuation decisions. And this page shows all of the referencing reference we use in this paper. And this is my presentation. Thanks for your listening. OK, thank you for the presentation. And I got from the organizer that the authors of this paper is not here in, 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 the, in the meeting. So we will not have questions. Uh, if you have any question, just contact with the author uh, through the emails uh, list, uh, listed in the paper. So we move to the our uh, next presentation uh, made by Mr. Li, I think. So, it's Wei um, from yeah. uh, the University of New South Wales, Australia, um, yeah. the great group. Uh, in this work, we would like to investigate for different style layouts for work management in open source DBMS, which is the board for efficiently retrieving and uh, quick querying. Besides, a benchmark has also been developed to compile various work so data management solutions concerning functionalities and performance. This is the outline of my presentation today. Uh, first, I will give a brief introduction of uh, yeah, what is Walkso and uh, yeah, is the model and applications. And secondly, um, the, yeah, I will uh, present the, the design for data layouts for Walkso data management strategies. And uh, the, the third part is the case study. Uh, we used uh, uh, a set of four buildings uh, of UNS the Kensington campus with 10 cm resolution Walkso as the case study data size. Last, uh, mm, we will discuss uh, and conclude our presentation. The first thing is, um, yeah, what is Voxel? Um, yeah, it is the Voxels are uh, Voxel magic web pixels, uh, which are spaced in a regular grid in three dimensional space and are perceived without graphs between them. In contrast to the similar concept of point clouds, Voxel can only inhabit discrete positions in space dedicated uh, by the grid. It is uh, regular and uh, 
all possible workstop positions are equally spaced. Uh, workstops are the quickest way to quick model and uh, virtualize well metric data, especially in nature and organic form formations. Applications for workstops include the virtualization and analysis of medical and the scientific data and uh, represents of uh, Turing in-game and simulations. Medical researchers are now using wall metric imaging to view MRI scans from different angles, efficiently to see the inside of the body from outside. Uh, Minecraft, uh, yeah, maybe you, you guys heard that, is a uh, sandbox video game. Uh, use voxel to store uh, Turing data. Geologists use, uh, often use voxel modeling uh, te techniques to model geological features like terrain elevation. More broadly, uh, scientists can use voxel-based modeling to virtualize and measure the volume of any, anything from a flood to green space in urban uh, urban scenario. Voxels are also fundamental in our recent approach to semantic labeling. I uh, use voxels to represent the spa uh, spatial con uh, constraints on scene labels. Also, um, yeah, same as the yeah, same as the management of other uh, geographic data, voxels have have. Uh, yeah, for, for many years now, be managed in the traditional way of using the file system without, uh, yeah, with different data structures. These files can then be stored in a hierarchical um, the, yeah, folder structure for sparse works on models, uh, such as 3D CD model with different uh, level of details and exit by the third party software. Generally, works can be characterized as being mostly um, statistical data sites. That means once voxels are preceded, there are few opportunities to modify or update them. During the last decades, relational database system, um, yeah, are most valuable used to the most um, metro database system, and they have all been applied in, in various industries to enrich geospatial functions and geospatial processing capabilities. In 2010, uh, um, open geospatial Consultium, uh, yeah, that is OG, OGC is issued OpenGS implementation specifications for geographic information. Uh, so, which define um, the basic geometric tabs like point, curve, surface, polygon. Uh, examples of uh, our object-oriented relational database system for geographic information include the post, uh, yeah, PostGIS and Oracle 11, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, and this relational database can define geospatial objects and adopt different index for fast uh, spatial queries. Mm, yeah, like the boundary tree, uh, yeah, sorry, boundary tree in SQL Server, boundary tree, R tree, and uh, uh, geo, uh, gener, uh, and yeah, and uh, geo lines the search tree in PostGIS. And uh, yeah, to make use of works of data in different scenario and efficient story and retrieval system is in there in it. Um, in this paper, we investigate four different data layouts for storing and management the 3D um, box of data in post, uh, yeah, post the circle and post GS. And then we, um, the first thing is this uh, flat array table. The second is the point geometry table. The third one is a multi point a geometry table. And the last one is PC patch table with the help of point cloud. Um, yeah, the majority storage models can be adopted for the box of management is uh, based upon the organization of voxels in the flat array table, uh, where each voxel is stored separately in a single row using a common data type, common data type uh, like integer or numeric or double. Each voxel attribute constitute a separate field. Mm, the voxels are populated in, uh, into a table and the index using a B tree index uh, in the X, Y, Z coordinates re uh, respectively. In our case, Mm, the coordinates are saved into uh, our full bat integer and the scale and offset is stored as a table properly. To enhance the data, uh, database in performance, PostgreSQL circle um, yeah, provides our index tab, B3, hash, uh, GST, SP, GST, and uh, GIN. Each index tab uses different algorithms that is the best suited to different types of queries. In our case, the, as for the flat, Array table, uh, we create a B tree index on X, Y, Z coordinates. Since the equal, uh, equality and the range query on these columns are most often in daily use, and then populate with uh, data from uh, using SQL script or SQL cell. An additional index uh, was then added on the column, uh, yeah, on the semantic columns. 
Mm, a, uh, yeah, a spatial point rep uh, represents a single location on Earth. This one is uh, uh, represented by a single coordinate, include uh, yeah, uh, either two, three, four dimensions. Points are also um, are also used to uh, represent objects where the exact uh, when the exactly details such as shape, uh, shape and, sh and st size are not important at the target scale. For point table, we keep both the semantic uh, like uh, semantic uh, information like the building ID and the IFC information ID and the creates one geometry column with 3D points in PostGIS. Multi point is another um, geometry that consists of a collection of points. In this kind of layout, we consider regarding each building object and each IFC object as one multi point. That means workshops in one multi point geometry has the same IFC uh, ID and object ID. When using the multi point geometry type, we need to consider how to catch voxel data, that is, uh, those voxels uh, stored in a multi point voxels, uh, sorry, multi point object. We propose a semantic based voxel data partition, uh, partitioning strategy. Specifically, we want to store all voxels with the same semantic information in a multi point object, including object uh, semantics and IFC semantics. Moreover, similar to point, two index B3 and GST are built on the semantic uh, columns and the uh, and geometry column respectively. And point cloud is a uh, yeah, it is a post degree circuit extension for storing point cloud or later data uh, where PC patch can be regarded as a potential structure uh, stru uh, structure used for management of walks so model in post degree circle. In our case we collect a group of voxels with the same semantic information into a PC patch. Each patch should hopefully uh, contain works so that are near each other. That is the same partition strategy as multi-point. Following the point class schema, um, yeah, um, yeah, we prepare a schema document to describe the contents of any particular voxel. Each voxel contains the three dimension uh, named X, Y, Z, and each dimension can be of integer data type with getting uh, 0.1 and this schema document is stored in the uh, in the point cloud formats table along with a PCID. Yeah, that the PCID is the point cloud identifier. Yeah, different from the multi point to representation, um, the GIS index is created based on the 2D bounds of the of the patch because it cannot be indexed directly on the PC patch tab. Uh, fortunately, as um, yeah, PC, uh, point cloud provided the uh, the PC envelope geometry functions that can directly obtain the uh, boundary box of a post uh, post uh, post JS polygon 2D. Therefore, we use in uh, we can index 2D polygon. So this is the whole uh, relational uh, data uh, design for our four different data layouts in uh, yeah in our post grid circle database. And uh, yeah, um, we use. Uh, uh, HP laptop with uh, 16 gigabytes RAM and uh, 2.8 uh, GHZ uh, Intel uh, Core CPU and uh, running the our algorithms uh, on our uh, Windows 10 Enterprise. Mm, so, and uh, we adopt a Postgres Circle 11 together with PG admin uh, version 4.3 as, uh, yeah, mm, as the RD, uh, RDBMS for storing and running the spatial semantic queries. For general queries, we directly use the PG admin to run the query and evaluate the running time. Moreover, as uh, yeah, so as to obtain ac accurate time for each query, we issue the command explain analyze um, the query. Um, and uh, further, is uh, we we use the QGIS software um, for uh, for virtualization analysis. We select part of the unit SW canceling campus, lower campus size case study, the raw voxel uh, data sites include for uh, star six buildings um, with total uh, 33, uh, sorry, 33 uh, million voxels uh, described in the table. And uh, we assign the ID and name for each building object, uh, such like the first building uh, named the uh, built environment with the building ID uh, uh, equals one. It is uh, worth noting that each data set has the same scale and different offset. Besides that, since um, mm, the data, uh, data source for the voxel data came from the existing BIM model, each voxel itself carries some IFC attributes like IFC BIM, IFC door, IFC window. So we naturally have the IFC semantic label. 
And the uh, first uh, semant uh, semantic analysis uh, regarding um, yeah, regarding to building uh, building object and FC features. The first experience uh, we are going to load all the voxel associated with the building uh, name the built environment in US Apple campus. The query is uh, yeah mm, the result of this uh, mm, uh, yeah the result is uh, uh, in this uh, uh, in this table uh, where the integer stand for the query happened on table with the integer data type and so do the uh, numeric. Uh, query time of array and multipoint is stable for the um, for discuss two data types, integer and, and numeric. Point takes uh, slightly more time for numeric type and PC patch cost less on it. It is obvious that, that multipoint and PC patch runs much faster than the first two data layouts due to the building object is uh, segmented into only a few partitions. And this, uh, the second experiment uh, is similar to the first, uh, first one, um, this time, yeah, we retrieved FC uh, semantic information. There are 24 um, different FC features in the, the whole data site, and we pick up the FC door as the query condition. That is our goal to retrieve all, um, uh, retrieve all doors in this, in this data site. So the figure is the, yeah, the work as a result of the second experiment. And we also investigate the sp uh, spatial analysis on different uh, data layouts. The third experience, um, yeah, in our case, we um, consider use the 2D box to represent the each building object and calculate distance between the two buildings as distance between the two center of the yeah, 2D box, which is the spatial data type you use to represent uh, represent the two dimension enclosing box of a geometry or a collection of geometries. And based on the above analysis, we search all buildings that uh, are yeah, that are within 100 meters of built environment. Um, our query result is virtualized in, in this figure, and uh, where um, yeah, uh, where we yeah um, from this figure, we can compare the time of um, of con constructing bounding box of uh, above queries, um, and. Uh, yeah, on different data types and their multi-point and PC patch data uh, layouts. The, the fourth experience, uh, we analyze some um, uh, yeah, positioning, uh, positional relations among rooms in USW campus based on Voxel mo uh, models, in which we are going to um, to search all rooms in, in the built environment, uh, which height is larger than the room of science theory. To achieve this query, we first should uh, acquire the roof head of the sign theory. And in this, in our works models, uh, attributes of value IFC space represent the room space, and we pick the minimum Z value um, as the head of one room where we adopt a point uh, layout since the multi point and the PC patch particu uh, particular IFC, uh, IFC object only has one geometry. Once you compile the geometry, you add a return a whole geometry or nothing, unless the geometry is broken up uh, into a single point. And um, in this, uh, yeah, um, at last in this paper, yes, a relation, um, relation of 3D geo database solutions for the management analysis for of voxel model with multi multiple scaling offsets were uh, present. For different uh, kind of data layers for voxel data management in post GS and PostgreSQL circle are investigating in this paper. A case study shows that different data layouts can be applied to different uh, situations to get better performance. Yeah, for instance, when retrieving a particular building or as the object in its entirety, it is better to consider multipoint and PC patch. Moreover, this two can go for uh, data layouts bring other benefits as well, such as a small disk space and faster loading. On the country, um, yeah, the flat array and point are more flexible data layouts that allow a user to look for one or some voxels with uh, uh, special, with special semantic information compared with array point as a basic geometry can take for advantage of switch functions inherent in the PostGIS. However, since some, only one voxel object is recorded so, uh, per row, these two representations can take up a lot of disk space in our test uh, the four Different data layouts take up uh, um, 1.6 GB uh, and 2.6 GB, uh, 16K, uh, K, uh, KB and, uh, and 16 KB of this space, respectively. 
And there are several possible directions can be explored in the, uh, for future works. First, how to decide the partitions for multipoint and PC pair schemas is a very interesting topic. For the time being, we divided the voxel object with same semantic wrapping to group. In fact, depending on different application scenarios we faced and the fre uh, frequent query object uh, options, we can consider different ways of partitions. Um, yeah, and uh, with the arrival of big data, um, yeah, works applications also require changeable data schemas, faster query response time, and more flexible suitabilities than traditional uh, relational database. Mm, yeah, to response to this new challenge, maybe the no third code database are now being adopted for geospatial data uh, management. We would like to design and implement 3D voxel management in this most popular uh, no third code database in the next step. Yeah, this is the reference, and uh, yeah, any question? Hello everyone, my name is Wei. Um, from okay, thank you for your presentation. So is there any question about this interesting presentation? So uh, I have one question. Uh, is that uh, it's very important to design the database to manage the voxels, uh, but uh, have you any idea that to combine the management of voxel with the management of more general uh, special data, for example, images or vector data, how can you combine these two data together? That I mean manage the voxels and also managing the, the images of vectors? Um, OK, thank you for your question. Um, the thing is, uh, mm, uh, I think that the, the question you mentioned is about um, how to do the, the data uh, integration um, for the, yeah, the different data source. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that is, uh, I also did uh, such uh, integration with uh, GIS data, Beam data, and some uh, and the point cloud data. And uh, so this work, uh, uh, yeah, I did that work last year. And uh, for this work, it's just uh, focused on the Voxel, uh, yeah, Voxel management. Since Voxel is, uh, um, yeah, it's, it is different from, uh, different from point cloud, different from uh, image, different from such GIS data, vector data. It is a very special 3D data, and uh, yeah, and I I know that currently no one and uh, did such a uh, investigation on the uh, management on voxel data. So yeah, I did this work. Uh, that is an uh, exploration for this uh, yeah for this data management strategy for voxel data. So yeah, that is. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So is there any more question about his presentation? So I think it's very clear and uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. So I think uh, we have all uh, our four uh, finished all our four presentations and uh, I would like to thank you all speakers for this session and also thanks for the participants for the audience to to be stay with us. With us. And also, I would like to thank you all technical support for this uh, special manner of this session. And I think this is the end of this session and thank you very much. <laughs>